um, you don't care where it came from. I wasn't lost, I was just misplaced. <laughs> Remember our films more for John Fassend and our music than, than anything else. Pitches a beach of a pass to Preston Carpenter. Let's take a look, shall we? And as they say in Tinseltown, roll on. When my father founded NFL Films in 1962, it would have been difficult to record music at our location in Philadelphia. The place was so small, we didn't have a space to hold three guys playing kazoos. Now, I'm in Music Scoring Studio A at our new production facility in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Although we've moved into the future, I can't help but look back to the early days when we didn't have a studio like this. We didn't even have a style then. How NFL Films developed a unique, identifiable, signature style is what this show is all about. Now this isn't going to be one of those self-congratulatory affairs where we pat ourselves in the back. Uh-uh. During the first years of our history, we were more deserving of a slap in the face. Before 1962, no one really made movies about pro football, so our influences were newsreels and those TV highlight shows that used to air on Saturday afternoons uh, scheduled somewhere between professional wrestling and roller derby. The company that churned out most of these weekly NFL highlights was Philadelphia-based Telra Productions. And Telra epitomized the old style of football movies. The old model was completely linear editing. Well, let's call it John Philip Sousa music and predictable, awful scripts. But don't count the Steelers out in this ding-dong dilly. Lynn Shadnoy takes a screen pass from Fakes and Hot puts it 51 yards down the sideline before going out of bounds on the New York 17. The Colts start dishing up trouble in the second quarter. Lenny Moore gets the ball and Lightning Len lights out like a frightened fox in a forest fire. The Reading Rocket roars non-stop to a 41-yard touchdown and Baltimore is on top 7 to nothing. In the third period, the Redskins are hunting more scalps. Little Chief LeBaron calls for a pass in the powwow. And when the fun's done, Walton is on the Packer 48. By 1965, we were producing highlight films for every team in the NFL. And our improvements upon the Telraw model were largely visual. We shot games in color, used more slow motion, and we filmed the action and the bench shots from the ground level. But when it came to the writing, we just couldn't shake the Telraw influence. Third year man Milt Plum pitches a peach of a pass to Preston Carpenter on the Pittsburgh 20. Milt Plum pegs a peach of a pass to Terry Barr as the Lions threaten. Milt Plum pegs a peach of a pass to Terry Barr for a first down on the Bear Four. In 1965, NFL Game of the Week gave us our first chance to showcase our talents on a regular basis. Here was a golden opportunity to pioneer a new, more serious and analytical way of writing football highlights. But even though we were working with polished narrators like Jack Whitaker, the frantic production pace of this show created a number of technical obstacles that made good writing difficult. The NFL Game of the Week. We didn't write the games of the week. You can't really call them scripts because they weren't scripts. These guys were reading the play-by-plays and then taking the play-by-play, -play, whatever was written on the play-by-plays, and trying to embellish it. The downfall of that is they did not have the technology to, if you blew a line, just go back and do the line again. If you were 10 minutes, 12 minutes into something, you had to go all the way back. It's just the way the technology worked and do it all over again. Eagle Bomb Squad Captain Ike Kelly, number 51, is knocked once, 
So what they ended up doing a lot of times was these really terse little sentences. Twice? Because they didn't want to make mistakes and go back and do the narration all over again. You know, we were young, you know, and there were, there's Chuck Thompson and Jack Whitaker. Three times. And you were leery of telling them uh, because they'd slap you down quick. You know, you say, you know, we need more out of you. We need, you know, you got to stretch this line, Jack. You might do it once, and then he'd look at you, or throw a pencil in the studio, or talk about his train back to New York, and then you'd retreat into your shell because you were scared to say something to these guys. Eagle center Jim Ringo limps off the field for a needed respite from the Sunday wars. The only time we really wrote something was if there was a very few cutaways, like a guy on the bench. Then we write a little line of script and insert it that he'd have to read. For guard Leon Donahue, it means needed rest from the Sunday wars. And the warriors and the generals. We thought this was pretty clever and pretty good, but it was kind of feeble attempts at any kind of writing. Feeble attempts at writing were especially apparent in anything involving the Redskins and Cowboys. Scripts about these two teams used metaphors that suggested our writers were shooting blanks. The Dallas Cowboys gallop into D.C. Stadium where the Washington defense is waiting to ambush. The Cowboys mount up as Jim Steiger gallops out of the end zone and stampedes through the Washington wigwam. That man Brown is back in the scene romping through the Redskin reservation for 36 yards. The Redskins apply their war paint and Jurgensen drums up heap big trouble for the Giants. And you had Tom Toms and you had sagebrush and you had tumbleweeds. You did all that stuff and you thought it was pretty clever. Now some random Packer plays. Pitts pounds past the Browns. Max makes tracks for the goal line. This time, Dowler is the prowler, and jarring Jim goes hiking through the Vikings, but Green Bay's star shines brighter by far as he orbits a 30-yard aerial to Dowler in first period activity. We had no sound to speak of at all and no interviews. So if you're doing a 30-minute film, you had to write wall-to-wall -wall script. You had no, very few interesting close-ups that you could write to. So we just were kind of fanciful in our writing. Holly makes Eagle fans jolly as he creases through the brown line and steps off 29 yards. Here he is, galloping Gale, carrying the mail. Marsh is harsh on the Redskin defenders as he circles to the Washington three. Good blocks by Watoska and Cadeal and the Colt line crumbles. Logan tumbles. And Bull rumbles 50 yards for Chicago's longest running play of 1964. When I hear those lines, I don't particularly like to hear them anymore, I mean, and say, well, who wrote that line? Well, you know, you either say, well, Steve did it, someone else did it, you don't want to admit it because they were so bad. We'd occasionally try to camouflage bad off. writing In by using sound effects. Of a greased pig race, the elusive ball pops into and out of one bosom after another. Roger Scholes finally recovers the Cleveland kickoff for a Cleveland touchdown. We wanted the scripts of our game recaps to be entertaining, but also analytical and authoritative. We attempted to combine the verbal with the visual by putting circles and arrows on certain plays to provide an inside look at what made the game tick. But these optical effects weren't always quite as insightful as we had hoped. Gail Sayers got laid out, and I had this brilliant idea. As he was prone on the field, it was a wide enough shot. Instead of just putting an arrow or a circle, or just leaving the shot alone like I should have, I thought, wouldn't it be great to put a coffin around him? So we had a coffin drawn, and it was a pretty good looking coffin, by the way. And then I, I think Steve's dad saw it and just went ballistic. I mean, how could you put a coffin around a man? And I felt very cowed and stupid at the time. And, I, and then we had to take the coffin off, we put a circle on it. When Sayers is laid to rest by a teammate's lethal block. But still, that didn't do any good either. That was kind of ridiculous, even putting a circle but but a But a coffin, uh, or one of those, that was one of the things that I did that I really want to forget. Uh, and I hate when anyone brings it up. 
In our 1965 highlight films, our writers not only had to come up with the right words to describe the season, they also had to script the United Airlines commercials that were shoehorned into the storyline of each film. Jim Brown leads the group toward the airplane. Coach Blanton Collier is next in line to board the United Airlines jet mainliner. I remember we had to edit the United Airlines commercials in and we did write them. Big six foot eight John Baker knows United Comfort accommodates all sizes and the Steelers will arrive refreshed and ready to play the Cardinals. The only thing we had to add was their taglines. Incidentally, 13 out of 14 NFL teams fly United. And by the way, 13 out of the 14 teams in the NFL fly the friendly skies of United. And remember, 13 of 14 teams in the National Football League fly with United Airlines. They call it pro football, was a landmark production for us. It starts with a whistle and ends with a gun. 60 minutes of close inaction from kickoff. It was the to first touchdown. film that contained the this essential elements of our identifiable the style. The men who play it are the best there are, disciplined professionals who perform on a stage 100 yards long. The script for They Call It Pro Football was terse and impressionistic. It emphasized the drama of the game. We stopped linear editing relying instead on quick tempo montages and we used bits and pieces of shots rather than entire plays. The editor on this film was a freelancer named Yoshi Kishi and he revolutionized the way we thought about film structure and how to organize shots. But what makes Yoshi's lasting influence so incredible is that he didn't know anything about football and when we hired him he knew even less about NFL films. Before Ed Sable called me up about this project. Uh, I had never seen any NFL films, had never seen a football game. My understanding of what NFL films were doing or what they had done was uh, zero. But Ed called me up one day and said um, he'd like me to work on a project. And I said, sure, because my attitude in life has always been, if I haven't done it, try it and I went down to Philadelphia to begin work on the Call of Pro Football. When I first heard about Yoshio Kishi, he, he was like an editing god. And, you know, it was an experiment to bring someone in who knew very little about football, to edit football. If the subject matter was complex, it was like brain surgery or anat human anatomy, then more knowledge might have affected the handling of the material. But in a case like this, um, obviously it's, it's a game and uh, it's not very complicated. You move 10 yards at a time until somebody stops you. And the goal is to get the uh, ball across the line and make a touchdown. And this takes place in a certain amount of time, which is limited. It's one play after another and they're basically the same. And uh, you don't have to have much intellection to get to understand it. This is the prologue, and you see how I tried to capture the essence of what a game is. Very simple. The ticking of the clock to show that time is effective. The various yard line markers to show that you have to go 100 yards for a touchdown. And then the rest is automatic about what, what is exciting about a game if you're not a, uh, a sports buff. The idea on a general level, on a common level, is to create a metaphor out of the images. Now you have a here, you have here a guy who on one level is taking off. He's becoming a bird. Therefore, it's common sense, the idea, the concept, the synecdoche, if you want to put it that way, is birdman, naturally you have birds, and things that fly, you have balloons, and therefore they're all linked together. And what happens is also, that you have the cowgirls. That those cowgirls are connected because they're flashing and they're birds. I mean, in British parlance, they're really literally birds. And um, the way they're flapping their um, torsos, they're like the flapping of uh, of the birds. When the man takes off in the jet, uh, I cut to a woman screaming. Now, that was to show the humor of the event. Uh, you can draw whatever impression you want of it. I may have seen that as a kind of, the woman is having an orgasm. 
and the man taking off is like a kind of impregnation. And so the cut follows. So here's the, here's the uh, first part, second part, third part. Fourth part, the joke, and the completion of it. And I wasn't concerned about real time and space. I was not interested in recording, but trying to excite people into seeing a, a football game. Throughout the 10 weeks that Yoshi spent editing, they call it pro football, I was always there to help him with the fundamentals of football. Uh, since he didn't know the game very well, I had to explain the difference between a linebacker and a defensive back to point out that Ken Willard was a fullback, not a wide receiver. But while I was teaching Yoshi about football, I was getting an education about editing. So we learned from each other during those many long discussions in the editing room. I was introduced to Steve Sable, and as far as I recall, we never had any discussion at all about anything. Ed Sable, I thought when I met him, he was a fine person, and I don't recall ever seeing him or even speaking to him again till that last day when I said, oh, hello, Ed, here's the film. Went out expecting to see Ed and Steve and maybe one or two other production people. But I found that the whole entire staff of NFL films had turned out to watch it around this tiny steam bag. And I was even surprised, not by the number of people, but also that somebody I had never met, um, Ed's daughter Blair was there, and I was completely taken aback because when you have a, a screening of a film, you don't invite relatives in, no matter how close. As a person, he was probably the most arrogant guy I had ever met. I mean, that was very off-putting because he was like the little mini-me god, you know. He strutted around and we were a bunch of bumpkins and we knew nothing. Uh, we were idiots, you know. You know, I just think, you know, he was a very talented prima donna. Most of the people you find in film production are either fools or knaves or simply people who don't know what they're doing. Having seen this for over, well, 35 years, uh, it comes as a surprise that it stands up so well. I cut the film so that it would be one piece. The version I saw last week had the commercial breaks in it. This is commercial. And those breaks, it's like, it's like coitus interruptus or foreplay interruptus or something. It breaks up the rhythm of the entire film, so you don't really get the effect of it. Everybody learned from him. Uh, you know, he showed little tricks about editing that we never knew. Uh, maybe we would have never known because we were just shooting football. I think Yoshio opened up our eyes about possibilities. I think he made us see things that we might have never seen before. And once we saw what he could do, I think then we start, it became a landmark about how we edited. We took chances. The hands of combat. The hands of prose. Until recently, we had completely lost touch with Yoshi Kishi. And he had definitely lost touch with NFL films. I haven't consciously looked for NFL films because I don't know where it is on the schedule anyway. Um, and I had no great interest. But in the past week, by happenstance, whereas normally if I saw something on football, I would just flick the channel to something else, uh, I saw something, something like the best bloopers or the best humorous something, which was on a couple of days ago, and I only watched it because of this shooting today. What I saw of it, I thought, forgive me, Steve, but I thought it was dreadful. of no man's land is patrolled by the linebackers. The search and destroy men of the defense. They call it pro football, Mark John Facenda's NFL film's debut. Number 50, search and destroy. Number 58, search and destroy. John's authoritative voice was a refreshing change from the way sports documentaries of the time were narrated. And the response to John's narration was overwhelmingly positive, although there was one dissenting opinion. 
someone else could have done just as well. He would not have been my first choice. For the audience crowding the stands, the drama begins with a slap of leather in the song of Men in Motion. He comes across very strong and punchy, which is okay considering that the reputation that sports film has of being um, hyperbole. This one simple fact tipped the balance of the game in the Cowboys' favor. John may have Their made a game seem more important than it was because he read lines with a dramatic directness. Buoyant, Before John, our films were narrated by play-by-play -by -play announcers like Chris Schenkel and move. Chuck Thompson. Having tried two power plays, Tittle sets up the Bears he hopes for this. But Phil King and the ball get a quick divorce. Sports announcer voices were always good for covering games live. They weren't particularly good at reading scripts. And Bucky's still a rather precocious and exuberant young man. John could make anything seem good. This is the face of the tiger. The other thing that happened was we wrote less script. And this, the action of the tiger. And the less script meant that the lines stood out more. And of course, John's voice stood out the most. Something somber in the skies. Something somber in the eyes of the men. Before John Facenda became the legendary voice of NFL films, he was the most watched news broadcaster in Philadelphia. John's nightly newscast was such a fixture that in 1957, it was used as a central plot point in a feature film called The Burglar. Needless to say, the film's publicity was built around the way Jane Mansfield was built, not the way John read the news. I discovered him in a uh, saloon. And the reason I knew who he was was because he was a newscaster. And every time I went in there, this man, John Facenda, was there. And he loved to talk football. I couldn't believe it. It's all he talked about. Football, football, football. He loved football. So I said, John, you know, I, I like your voice. How would you like to narrate one of our films? He said, oh, I'll do it for nothing. Just, just let me try it. Bob, I don't know about you. I'm disappointed with the first half. I thought he did not have uh, what you call the, the theatrical temperament or the screaming or the carrying on. Facenda was such a nice man while he was doing the narration. And as they say in Tinseltown, roll em. The autumn wind is a pirate, blustering in from sea. With a rollicking song, he sweeps along, swaggering boisterously. While John Facenda's way with words made our audiences think, Sam Spence's music made them feel. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here, and a seal here, and to try to run this play in the alley. Jim Taylor, number 31, is a fullback. And this they is call the it pro football, demonstrated that Sam Spence's thunderous percussion and snarling brass often said more than a line of script could express. It was obvious that Sam's compositions represented a radical departure from the football music of the time. It would be nice to say that we immediately realized the dramatic potential of music. But our 1963 championship film demonstrates that we were kind of clueless. Here was Chicago's George Hallis, a towering figure in NFL history, winning his first championship since 1946. Well, listen to the music we thought would be the perfect accompaniment to this inspiring moment in NFL history. This was a tune to consume beer and pretzels by, and when we started producing team highlight films, we continued to be partial to pulp. It took us a while, but it began to dawn on us that polkas and college marches were outmoded and inappropriate for the sport we were covering. And we decided that we had to make a big push on music. And I always wanted a big band. I didn't want any plinky plink plinks, three or four piece orchestra. 
I wanted lots of brass and drums. Brass and drums. That to me was sports. We found a fella who was doing music for some television shows. He was teaching music at the University of Southern California. His name was Sam Spence. And he was getting ready to go to Germany uh, because they gave him a good deal over there to do background music for, for television shows. Once my dad had found out that musicians and recording sessions were less expensive in Germany than they were here in the States, and once we heard the first pieces that Sam composed for us, we knew the days of polkas and John Philip Sousa type marches were over. Sam became our house composer and a vital element in our growth as filmmakers. Sam and his wife Friedel live in Munich, Germany. That's where he's done all of his composing and conducting for NFL films, and that's where he created a sound that was totally new to sports films. Sam's music wasn't newsreel music. It was film score music, and it was dramatic, and it was emotional, and it wasn't boilerplate background. It wasn't wallpaper. It was there to invest the emotion in the images you were seeing. Scoring is just a matter of blood, sweat, and tears, you know. Writing music is like writing a letter. A lot of people ask me, how in the world do you write music? And I tell them, when you, when you write a letter, how do you write, write a letter? You get an idea in your head and you get an image of what you want to say, and then you write it down. Well, I hear these things and see the, the image of football and write the music accordingly. Piccolo. I like a good piccolo. <laughs> the most important thing in music, I believe, is melody. And uh, a melody has to stick in the ear, you know. It, they have a wonderful uh, word in, in German called Orwurm, you know. A piece of music has to be like an earworm that, that digs into your ear and doesn't give you any peace. One time I figured out, I figured, oh my, I've done about the equivalent of 70 symphonies, 50, 60, 70 symphonies. Beethoven only did nine. <laughs> Where would I have been without my wife, too? She was always sitting in the booth, writing down the numbers, and said, you, you might want to splice take number three to take number two at this spot, that spot. So I would hear something he could not hear, then I would say, stop! Once more we're feeling, you know. <laughs> the way we all came to know the music was through these images of the National Football League. So now in everyone's subconscious, they're linked forever. I have a passion for all kinds of music, but Sam Spence is certainly my favorite. It's just provided endless listening pleasure since I was eight years old. Cinderella Super Bowl I like. Everybody at school I used to play that for. It was a great sort of Russian catchy tune. Old man Willie running and you hear da 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 Heroic Mission, I forgot to mention that, which never made it to vinyl. Do 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 and that great ending to the drums. Da 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 March to the Trenches is very good. Sunday with Soul. Da 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 and that's it. I'm not singing any more, although I could sing about four hundred other ones that I like very much. The Raiders theme, of course, everybody knows that. Da 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 Battleground, Latin Fire, Game Plan for Sudden and death, rainbows to the end zone, the over the hill gang, which everybody knows, and I have to hum that one. My wife certainly knows uh, all about Sam's music now and appreciates it very much, hums tunes and says, I like this one and this one, and it's part of our life. It makes me feel good, like a two, in two and a half minutes, it could turn a rainy day into a bright sunny day sometimes for me. Andy Horowitz has probably met Sam in person more times than I have. I'd see Sam on his occasional visits to the States, and getting to know him convinced me that his music provides a portrait of his personality. Uh, diverse, buoyant, optimistic, and warm-hearted. But my 35-year relationship with Sam 
has primarily developed over the telephone. I never once went to Germany for a recording session. Several months before the beginning of each football season, I'd call Sam and describe as vividly as I could the kind of music I wanted for our upcoming films. Then, for inspiration, I'd send Sam a tape filled mostly with movie soundtracks, but also an occasional jazz or rock instrumental. The result was that every year I found that Sam not only brought to life the feelings I expressed over the phone, he also gave life to feelings I couldn't express or articulate. He'd write back and forth and send tape, tape saying, this is a piece of music that I like, and, and if we can do something like this and like that, and uh, we, we were on the same wa wavelength. Oh yeah, the Magnificent Eleven. Big Western. The biggest influences on me were, of course, all the Hollywood, big Hollywood composers, you know, Miklos Rocha and, and uh, Dmitry Tjomkin. Well, these guys were, uh, were doing great things, you know, and I was just flabbergasted. I don't particularly care for the, uh, uh, the rock and roll type of stuff or the hippie stuff. I still like the big sound, solid music. Like Steve often says, the victory at sea type of music. The palms of your hands will thicken, the skin of your cheek will tan. You'll grow ragged and weary and wet, but you must do the best you can. The music made a big impression on, on, on a lot of the people. They remembered our films more for John Fassend and our music than anything else. Ed Sable is a tremendous guy. He had a way of dealing with people that made you feel you're part of the, his family, you know? And he'd talk over any of his problems with you. And one time he said, Sam, he says, I'm worried. I'm worried. I can't get Steve to take a look at the administrative side of, of NFL. He's only interested in the artistic side, sitting at the table cutting films, and I, I just can't, can't drag him away. I have these meetings with the with the uh, owners of the clubs, and they, they said, hey, I thought you were going to bring your son along. What is he, some kind of a cretin that you're not, that you're hiding him from us? And I said, and the administrative side of things will come, as long as Steve is interested in the artistic side. Winds whisper of high hopes. Victories Sam in the sky. had astonishing range, from brassy big band eyes. tunes to familiar Enjoying folk melodies, to broad, sweeping field, symphonic pieces. The rhythms of his music emphasize the rhythms inherent in pro football. To me, the exciting thing about music is being able to work in many directions, and that's why the NFL music has been always my favorite, uh, my favorite occupation. When we went to Germany to interview Sam for Lost Treasures, we decided it would be a great idea if Sam composed some new music, just for this show. So, Sam and I started working together, just like we did in the old days, over the telephone. Hello? Sam Spence. Hey. You recognize this voice? Hey, Steve. Good to hear from you. You got your baton ready? Oh, that'll be great. That'll be terrific. This is like NASA sending John Glenn back into space. Oh, boy. We're looking, I think, at, at basically five different pieces. But I'm going to start out, we want to start out with a, a first piece. And uh, I wanted to call it, a working title would be Game Day. Game Day. Hey, maybe we should call it Game Day. And we need uh, a sound that, that conveys that, that sort of breath-stealing intensity that throbbing heartbeat that you experience in a locker room before the game. The players are sitting on their stools, they're concentrating, some guys are reading the Bible, some guys are asleep, some guys are just staring at the ceiling, but we need a sort of throbbing sound that, that builds the tension. Then we're going to follow them out on the tunnel. Of course, this is to me, this is a, a fastball right down the middle of the plate for you. 
I'm going to have an eight foot diameter uh, Grand Casa bass drum for you. It's something you can feel in your chest, you know. You not only hear it in your ears, you feel it in your chest. The second piece, we start out super slow motion. We're in the line. You see that this is a laborious, uh, earthbound. It's almost, I, I sense here, like a lumbering waltz. And uh, this is the waltz of the Goliaths for the first part. And you see our photography, the, the snot spraying, the sweat flying, the butt cheeks rippling, all in clods of dirt, the slow motion. I can hear it already. <laughs> I can hear it already. We go with this for about 35 seconds. And then after that, we come out of this sort of chaos with this emerging sound of what I would call a, a clear strategy. This is where one team suddenly begins to make the game its own. That's a feeling that when that begins to happen, that should, that should raise the hair on the back of every football fan because they know they'll know exactly what that means. And in the tape that I sent you, the one thing that I don't want, and you'll hear, are these kazoos. For some reason, they ruined this, this march with these, these stupid kazoos, but I'm sure as soon as you'll, you hear them, you'll know that they won't work for us. <laughs> we want real instruments. There you go. <laughs> Sam was back in the Bavaria Music Studio, where he had conducted much of his great NFL films music and many of the same musicians who had played on those classic tunes were on hand for this special reunion. Yeah, that's the first time to do it. Yeah, that's the first time to do it. Yeah, that's the first time to do it. Yeah, that's the first time to and he hasn't slowed down a bit. With his trademark speed and efficiency, he recorded them all in a single day. These are the two marches. First, Steve was suggesting we do these two numbers together as one piece, but we can use them, you know, in the, in the library much better if they have a separation. Look at all those notes. <laughs> I can't believe you wrote every one of them. I can't believe it. <laughs> this, uh, Swirling right. violins and piccolos, for oh, swirling wood, woodwinds, you know. And the ostinato on the bass. And the reason I came to Munich is because a little place like Munich has five full-time symphony orchestras. Yeah. What what city in America has five full-time symphony orchestras? Right. You know, none of them, let alone a little, a little place like Munich. You know. Right. Going That's to that Munich recording session that. was. The for myself was like stepping into a time machine. You know, what would it be like to go back and see Sam Spence in action in a recording studio, walking into the room and meeting the musicians that were the same musicians who had played it the first time around? Yeah. Well, he is uh, like uh, like a Jesus <laughs> for us, <laughs> because a beautiful composer, a beautiful arranger, and everything is. He writes, it's really so at, at a high level. It is different from the music we have in Europe, because first, we don't have this kind of music on the, on the football games. Yeah. They don't use it. And, uh, well, he says that is the way they want it in America, so we have to believe it, that we played it. And in the beginning, we have to ask, are you sure, Sam, about it? Yeah, yeah, he says, play it that way. It must be strong and go. Football is for us soccer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's we did a lot of film music also with him here. One of the most famous thing is the film Car Napping. You know the story about the car? And we need specially deep uh, timpanis, kettle drums, you know, because uh, to get those big guys on the line, you know, whamming at each other, you, you got, can't have your timpanis too high, you got to have them really nice and low where you can lay into them, you know. And, uh, Otherwise, a oh, Grand Casa. Steve, Steve loves Grand Casa. Boy, that is a beautiful bass drum, Grand Casa. Oh, man, that is beautiful. This is the boss's favorite sound of all. It's, you feel that deep down in your chest, you know? <laughs> Connie. 
kann ich Blech haben? Vielleicht hilft das, wenn es, wenn es kurz ist. Nicht legato. Waltz of the Glass. Drei Viertel, Waltz. Gibt es noch was? Mit Konzentration. Was? Was war los? Mm. Na, ah, zu früh eingeschrieben. Maybe there's a, mi a mistake in the note. Ja. Yeah. Can we play everybody but percussion uh, a little slower from bar 60? From bar 60 without, without play, playback. There, there was a mistake. There was a mistake. It's after the dump, da 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 dump. You've got to start at the same place for us to know when to come in. Drei, vier, eins, zwei. So the Goliaths is vintage Sam Spence, and it provides the perfect complement to some of our vintage camera work. Forty years ago, pro football was a different game, but the passion, the conscience, and the soul of the sport remain the same. In his music, Sam has always been able to capture and distill that essence of the game, and that's why his music is timeless, and that's why it's still relevant. Eins, zwei, drei, vier. NFL films began to mature when we realized that the story of a game or season, rather than the outcome, is what made for compelling viewing. We grew up when we focused on the personality of a player 
rather than his statistics. And from there, it became a matter of how to portray these ideas on film. And that's when we developed our own unique style. Sam Spence, John Facenda, and Yoshi Kishi. Each one of them made a lasting contribution. On this play, Thomas shows his versatility by shooting down the sidelines on the Eagles. And then shooting up and down. Up and down. Up and down. Blitz is big in Pittsburgh. Eager John Campbell convinces Sonny Jurgensen to do the monster mash. Fans who flock to D.C. Stadium always enjoy the pregame and the halftime pageantry presented by the Redskin management. The annual Christmas Spectacular is highlighted by a space-age Santa Claus. The Redskinettes cavort as curvaceous Go-Go Girls. Incidentally, 13 out of 14 NFL teams fly United, the airline of champions. And, mm, cut it from it. I don't want you to waste the film. <laughs>